Thank you for joining us. This is Post Arena, Hondo, Tyler, and Buck talking about the show, I Shouldn't Be Alive. I believe we're on episode six. Yep. Uh, in this episode, a man has a plane crash in, uh, what is it? In Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe. Um, and can't really move. He gets stuck for longer than he should have. Or yeah. Longer than would be survivable for most people. Um, we've got Tyler with the notes today. He's going to be walking us through this this situation. Yeah. So, as you said, episode six, this one's called The Jaws of Death. And it took place in Zimbabwe in 2003. It wasn't like a specific date or anything in the episode, but it just said the year was 2003. So, it's we have to go off there. That, that's relatively recent. I mean, that's... Yeah. That's, that's really that's close. That's like 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and so the um, guy that the episode sent around, his name is uh, Greg Rasmussen, and he's a conservationist from England working in Zimbabwe. He has a, uh, I believe it's a wild painted dog uh, conservation effort that he runs at the front. So he's, uh, what's going on with the plane crash, he's uh, looking for a lost rhino, and he happens to have a pilot license and his own ultralight plane, so he figures, hey, that'd probably be the easiest way for, you know, a lot of ground to be covered and track down this rhino, because the rhinos are also outfitted with electronic tracking devices, so we had a device on his plane to fall down. So he's like, all right, I'm gonna go look around for this lost rhino because just wanted to make sure it hadn't been, you know, killed by poachers or anything like that because that's one big thing he was about and there was a lot of poachers. So he goes out and looks for it. And the one thing that um, he mentioned with the ultralight plane is they don't work great in super hot weather because they're so light. The air is a lot thinner when it's hot, so it's a lot harder to keep the plane in the air. And so what eventually happens is that he's um, going to make a circle around where um, the device is tracking that rhino and he has a wing stall, so one wing is working, but the other wing isn't, so he just spirals down, can't get any sort of control, and crashes pretty violently into the ground and knocks him out. And then he wakes up a bit later, doesn't say how much later, because obviously he didn't know exactly when he crashed, but then... So, once he uh, crashes, he wakes up and he realizes that there's a fuel line or something broken on the plane and it's dripping gas onto him, so he pretty quickly pulls himself out of the plane, because the only thing you can imagine is something happening in the plane lighting on fire, whether something hits somebody, he's like, yeah, don't feel like getting burned alive in my plane, so he gets out pretty fast in that, which I think was a smart decision, yeah. because while the plane never did end up catching on fire, running the risk of it would be pretty damn terrible. I mean, yeah, you, you see dripping fuel, there's a crash, you get away from it. That, yeah. That's 100% no matter what the scenario is, that's the right call. Um, so yeah, quick thinking, as soon as he comes yeah. to, he does that. That's, that's, um, that's showing that he has a lot of... Um, Situational awareness. Exactly. Um, especially after being knocked out. Like, coming yeah. to and pretty much being like, you know what, I smell gas, I gotta get out of here. Yeah, with such a violent crash, like literally falling out of the sky in a plane. Yeah, that's pretty violent. Yeah. And he has to pull himself out of the plane because he notices his legs aren't working, but right now the adrenaline is still kicking, so he doesn't feel any pain or anything. So he crawls out, and then he pretty quickly realizes that he should probably bring himself back to his plane to use his radio and try to signal for a mayday call because it'd be the easiest way for him to get help as soon as possible. And actually the only way. So he crawls back to the plane and goes to use the radio. And unfortunately, when um, the plane crashed, it destroyed all the electronics and completely fried the radio. So he was like, oh, great. I don't really have any way to signal for help because in the plane, what he always had was a tracking gear, no food, water, or any survival gear, anything like that. So he's like, all right, got to stick it out. I mean, that's our first... Um... I mean, obviously, this guy knows what he's doing, mm -hmm. but as we've said before, the, the best way to get out of a survival scenario is to prevent it. Yeah. Don't ever go anywhere through any harsh environment, whether you're driving, flying, whatever, without some some survival gear. Yeah. Whether that's just a couple of granola bars, I mean, that's going to get you that much further. Yeah. Um, and especially going out on an adventure like that in hot African summer, I'm imagining when this happened with no water. To me, just like, that just seems like a really bad idea in the first place. Um, I do remember him saying something about their water supply getting damaged. Yeah, there was a bunch of elephants that trampled through and broke a water line. But like, even then, I'm like, alright, maybe delay the trip a little bit. Yeah. Or something like that. Because just it's, going without water, especially in that environment, yeah. is a, it's a really risky idea. Not to rag on the guy, but it's just, you know, that, that's an oversight, in my opinion. And I mean, in something like this, he's doing what he what he can. He's doing what he believes in. Yeah, he's um, very passionate about his job. He says that multiple times in the episode. Obviously, it's easy to say that from the comfort of our our desk table. Um, 
there are always those last minute scenarios where you're like, I just got to go, mm -hmm. you know, I got to do this. And the whole thing we're trying to, to push through is just no matter what, got to take that little extra time to make sure you have something. With yeah. You. So, um, try to learn from others' mistakes. So, yeah, and I'm sure he definitely learned from his own. Oh, I'm sure he doesn't go anywhere with, uh, with that water now. Yeah. And so finally the uh, adrenaline wears off and the pain kicks in and he realizes his legs are just completely destroyed, broken in multiple spots. I mean, they won't work at all. And then the one thing he starts noticing is that his feet and ankles are what hurt the absolute most because they're trying to swell up from the brakes. But since he's wearing, you know, tightly laced boots, it's just the swelling has nowhere to go. So it's really just compressing against his boots and seems to have at least a decent bit of field medical knowledge because he realizes something that I would have never even thought of is that without containing the swelling, it could actually cause his foot to become gangrenous really quickly. So he's like, all right, I need to get my boots off, which I learned something from that. That's a pretty cool idea. And so he drags himself, uh, cause there's no way he can, he doesn't have the core strength to pull himself up and take out his boots. So what he does, he uh, drags himself over to a tree and it's a thorny tree, so it's stabbing him, but he's like, this sucks. But then realizes, wait, thorns and they're kind of hooked. So he actually takes a branch with a really hooked thorn on it and uses it to pull his boot laces completely out of the boots. And then he's like, all right, this isn't helping. So he grabs a big stick and then pushes his boots off. And he actually happened to be wearing a watch, which didn't get busted in the plane crash. And he realized it took him two and a half hours to go through the whole ordeal. Cause like, I won't get into super nitty degree details, but like basically the entire time he was just in ridiculous amounts of pain, which is why it was really hard for him to be able to do it. Also reaching with a stick, obviously not the yeah, ideal way to do it. I've never experienced a broken bone, just a couple of fractures. And those can be excruciating. Oh, yeah, you gotta, let alone having mashed legs that are yeah. almost he i believe in the episode he says that he thinks he's gonna lose his legs yeah and, he was uh, at least concerned about for sure the biggest risk of definitely losing his feet and if the grain grain spreads he could easily lose his legs even if he got his boots off he doesn't know what condition the bones are in whether they're yeah. stable or not yeah i mean again you gotta admire the the sheer tenacity of this guy to save to <laughs> the, take care the, of himself. The, the presence of mind, even through that that insane amount of pain, mm -hmm. to not only know to get the shoes off, but to drag yourself to a tree, come up with using a stick to pull the laces off, and another stick to push them off. Again, through the pain, because you got to think, mm -hmm. if you've ever been in that kind of pain, anything, um, pushing those off with a stick would have been incredibly painful. Yeah. It just aggravates the pain. And yeah. so... And from his, you know, retelling your story in the episode, the doctor said his legs were broken in six different places. That's a lot of fractures. Yeah, it's painful. And especially, he's doing this after his adrenaline wore off. Yeah. Which, again, I mean, it, the presence of mind to do all that through that pain. Absolutely genius. Yeah. The guy's got a... Everybody we've talked about in these, these episodes, um, they've got something special inside of them. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, that's why we want to try and get everyone, want to get yeah. more people to understand that we all have that. It's just a matter of bringing it to the surface when it counts. Yeah. And around this time, um, so back at the conservation we love from that his friend, uh, Peter runs with them, the warden of that whole like wildlife conservation area comes in and lets Peter know that people think that he's missing because with how long he's been gone, they didn't see how they figured he's missing, but I was imagining they're thinking ultralight plane probably doesn't have a lot of fuel so far realizing there's no way you can be flying for that long yeah well yeah at this point it's got to be four or five hours yeah um yeah because who knows how long he was knocked out and how long it took him to wake up yeah well and then he was the fly time and so mm -hmm. you gotta think maybe two hours of fly time and then yeah. two and a half hours get the shoes off mm -hmm. like yeah they're starting to worry which another major thing with survival anytime you're going out flying, hiking, mm -hmm. whatever, somebody should always know when to expect you back. Yeah. Because if they don't know when to expect you back, if they wouldn't have known, mm -hmm. you know, something probably happened to them, it's been too long, they would never would have sent help. Yeah. So. And then so uh, the temp was well over 100 degrees and actually because, and by this time, because of that whole incident we talked about where the elephants ruined his water line, Greg already hadn't had any water for 24 hours. So he was already just naturally dehydrated, but now being stuck out in that baking sun it was just accelerating the dehydration it. yeah like and so he decides that what he needs to do is he knows the most dangerous part of being out there is the nighttime because that's when all the predators are coming out because they're trying to avoid the heat too 
So he's like, all right, I need to get back to my plane and shelter. And this whole time he's been moving himself with his elbows on his back and he realizes he doesn't have the strength to do that anymore. So in another just amazing strength of mind and just presence of self moment, he takes another big stick of really long that's almost as long as one of his legs, takes both of his boot laces, wraps it around the bottom and top of his leg and grabs the lace and yanks on it to roll himself over through the insane amount of pain. Like the level of just like clearness of mind he has in this is just amazing. Like I was, I was stunned. It's ingenuity. And yeah. again, this the strength of will to get the, get that next task done. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Absolutely yeah. insane. And then he makes it back to the plane. And then the first uh, animal encounter he has is he hears a herd of elephants going towards him. And being a very well-trained conservationist and biologist, he knows there's one thing about elephants is that if they notice you before a certain amount of time, they'll just be like, okay, something's there, whatever, and they'll just keep walking by. But if it's too late, they'll get freaked out and they'll stampede. And so right now he doesn't really have much of an idea what to do. He's just like, all right, trying to at least move around a little bit and make sure he knows. Then he hears them stop, hears the elephants call, and then they just kind of turn around and walk away. So he's just, okay, got lucky sort of thing, but it's like... That presence of mind, knowing that he'd at least have to alert them to his presence before they got close. Now, his skills with biologists are really coming in handy really quickly yeah. in this situation. Oh, yeah. I mean, knowing a little bit about any kind of wildlife. Yeah, especially in the area you're in, that's a really smart thing to do. Yeah. Because, I mean, horses will actually do the same thing. Yeah. If you're, you know, you a horse wanders up on you, they don't notice you, and then you move. If you're, you know, in this situation laying on the ground, they mm -hmm. will trample you. Um, it's a natural response, so... Horses, yeah. elephants. It, any herd animal. The, 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 that same piece of info could be useful on pretty much any continent, is what I'm yeah. saying. The, you know, elephants aren't the only thing. Mm. Stuff a little closer to home. Yeah. You'd have the same kind of thing with Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buffalo will run towards you if they think you are a threat, and all of them will do it at the same time. Oh, yeah. Very scary. Yeah. yeah. And all this. During all this time, Peter and the warden are trying to search for Greg, and the one that makes the search really difficult is they only had one tracking device that could pick up where the rhinos were, and Greg had it on his plane, so unfortunately they didn't have any way to get a location on it. I think they had like a 200-mile radius that they were looking for him in, so that first just entire night of searching, they just had completely no success. And so eight hours later, I believe, after Greg pulls himself over to the shelter or something like that, like... He noticed this weird sticky sensation in his lips and quickly realized that they basically turned to plastic. He, I believe the term he uses is plasticized. And then, like, a piece of his lip literally falls off into his mouth. Like, he's just that insanely dehydrated. I've been there. Yeah. It's not pleasant. Don't do that. Drink yeah. water. Yeah, and then around that time, he hears a lion walking towards him. And through its vocalizations, he can tell it's a lioness looking for her cubs. And so he's like... Oh. <laughs> that's not a good place to be and then again his skill set comes in handy here he realizes that a lot of predators or like prey or anything like that will usually use like really loud sharp noises to scare off you know something that's coming after them so he's like all right he's that tactic and he grabs his stick and smashes it against the side of his uh plane and the lion is like don't want any of that and leaves which is uh pretty, pretty good presence of mine again it scares yeah. it off yeah and then as a little bit after that happens, sun's starting to set, and Greg hears a uh, plane flying overhead, and he's like, oh, maybe I'm saved, but then the plane quickly, you know, the sound fades away, and he has a moment where he's like... It's over. Yeah, it's over, and then he kind of, like, internalizes at first. He's like, I've done what I want to in life. I'd be happy to die, but then he realizes I keep doing so much more, and so basically his love of conservation gives him the strength to keep carrying on, which I think is a you know really admirable it's thing. It's kind of a, a his survival was now people are probably gonna get mad at me for using this word. It was as selfish as it was selfless. Yeah. He wanted to do things, but he wanted to do things for what he loved and it was yeah. the painted dogs. Yeah. He literally wanted to were, save himself so he could save others. Yeah. And, you know, working with the rhinos and yeah. stopping poachers. Conservationalism is a beautiful thing. And Absolutely. this man is a great person, in my opinion. It brings me back to uh, Chris Moon from our last episode yeah. talking about how yes. he, he, he knew he had to get through it 
because his program wouldn't keep going if, if he, he, if he didn't through. make it through. And so, again, it's they have something they want to do. I mean, it's, it's a big deal to have something to live for. Mm. Um, everybody should should have something to live for. Yeah. Yeah. So then this time, uh, by this time, night falls, and that's when Greg's biggest fear starts kicking in, which is hyenas, because hyenas are extremely vicious, have the strongest jaw strength or bite force, whatever you want to call it, in the world, and he's seen, like, fully able-bodied, you know, fit men get annihilated by a hyena, like, leaping away from them, the hyena just <laughs> done. So hyenas he's like, are scary. Yeah, hyenas are, like, one of the scariest animals in Africa. And then, so... We're, it was around 4 a.m.-ish by Greg's figuring you know, that or maybe had a little light where he could look at his watch. And uh, he hears, because he can actually tell what all these animals are by the sound of their footfalls because he's grown so used to these sounds that he just knows it is. And he hears his worst nightmare, a hyena slowly walking towards him. What does it do? Same exact tactic he used against the lioness. Works like a charm. So it's obviously a very proven thing. Just make a loud noise, scare off the predator. One thing he does note about that, startling him away, um, if I recall... He does know that if you do it when they're too far away, it's going to pique their curiosity and they're going to want to come and find out. Mm -hmm. If you do it when they're too close, it's going to scare them to attack. Yep, fight or So fight he talks about in. he's listening to the footprints or footfalls and trying to make sure he's startling them at the right distance. Because yeah. again, if you scare something and it's right next to you, it's going to attack. Mm -hmm. It's going to lash out. If it's too far away, it's not going to scare. It's going to be like, oh, what's that? Dinner. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, someone's ringing the dinner bell. All right. <laughs> so again, <clears throat> he just notes that the right timing is good, and unfortunately, that's going to be a little different for every animal. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then so he makes it through the night pretty uneventful. He didn't specifically say whether he slept or not or anything like that. But once the sun rises, at first, Greg's spirits are boosted really well because he's like, "All right, I made it through the night." But then he quickly realizes, "Wait." Now the intense heat's coming back, so now that dehydration is going to set in even worse. And so around this time that uh, plane that was searching for him takes off again, but this time the warden of the conservation area hops on board because he knows the area really well, and he also knows the general area where Greg would have started his search, so he knows exactly where, like, all right, this is where we should at least start looking for him. Yeah. And so Greg um, starts using his uh, GPS, which... I believe it was just a standalone battery powering unit and then they get destroyed in the plane crash when he quickly realizes that since they don't have their own GPS trackers and don't know what sort of signal location to look for, it's not really going to do anything for him. And he almost treats it like if he dies, because every time he turns it on, records the time location, it would just be like a log of, oh, hey, you know, his last signal here was 1140. We found him at 12 o'clock. So, you know, if we'd found him 20 minutes earlier, we could have saved him. So he's also like, you know, I don't really want to put that on the people who are looking for me, which I think is a very interesting and kind of almost, again, selfish but selfless act. It's like kind of an interesting thought process that I've never I never I, I see a nobility in that. Yeah. Not wanting them to know they were just five minutes too slow. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah. I can see how that could mm -hmm. destroy a person. And these people searching for him, you got to remember, they all know who he is. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are really good friends, you know? Yeah. Would you want to put that on your best friend knowing... They were two minutes late. Like, that's... Yeah, that's within the rest of your life. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That that's... kind of thing is like, I could have... I could have just skipped that bathroom break, and I'd have, he'd have been saved. And yeah. Yeah, that's... There is a nobility in that, mm. so... And so then, uh... Again, unspecified time frame here. But then Greg hears the plane overhead again, and he's like, all right, this time I need to make some sort of active effort to let them know I'm here. So his immediate attempt is like, you know what? I'm gonna try using my radio one more time. Because he was in, like just the weakest signal like they hear literally anything coming through they'll know there's something in the area so the plane will know they're in the right area so they'll just fly off and he's like this isn't working so then he uh, takes one of the struts i believe that was broken off the plane he's like you know what this is made out of metal and i don't know if the plane was like super painted or anything so it's pretty shiny so he starts waving around in the air to the best of his ability to uh um try and signal the plane and the warden catches the flash of light out of the, out of his eyes and he's he grabs his binoculars, looks, and sees there's a plane crash. He can't see Greg, but he sees the crash plane. And Warden is immediately like, it's impossible to land the plane here. And just signals the entire search team to head back to the base so they can form a team to go get Greg. And then, basically by then, they all just get in, I believe, like a Jeep or something like that. Drive off to the area and 
as Greg like kind of like feels himself start to slip over the edge, the rescue team finds him. Well, yeah, and you know that plane flying away, that's demoralizing. You're thinking yeah. it's yeah. not. It, it's rare that a rescue plane flies over the same area twice, mm -hmm. um, let alone three times. Yeah. So that's going to be demoralizing, and yeah, he does start slipping. But again, they rescued him. Um, it's all quick thinking on his part. Mm -hmm. Important to note this whole time. I mean, both legs broken. He talks about how, yeah. I believe overnight he was on his stomach. Yeah. He, he yeah. spent the night on his stomach. So hearing the hyena, the lion, mm -hmm. the elephant, he's on his stomach. The most no, 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 you know, doesn't have the strength mm -hmm. to push himself up. So he's down on the ground. Can't see anything behind him. And like mm -hmm. uh, keeping his head through all of that. Um, Amazing. Absolutely astounding to have that that level of will, yeah, presence of mind, and again the uh, ingenuity mm. of all of it is just insane. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the one thing I have for the little aftermath of it is that he went uh, over, I believe it was over a hundred surgeries to save his legs, but they actually did successfully save them, rehabilitated them, and learned to walk. And he's actually back in Africa running the conservatory. Although, and I don't blame him on this, he's never flying a plane again. And that was at the filming of this episode of this episode yeah. of I Shouldn't Be Alive. At this point, mm -hmm. that probably filmed what ten years ago. Yeah, maybe don't he's know. flying planes again. We don't know. But um, yeah, the whole story is just every ep every one of these stories is just insane. And yeah, it almost feels like each one gets more intense than, than the last one. Oh yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've watched a few of them. They're absolutely insane. Just insane. Oh no. Um, that to me is insane in him pushing through the situation so he could actually help yeah. is a, a awesome. very good thing and we could use some more people like that in our world. Well, again, it's, it goes back to that the last episode with Chris Moon. He talked, you know, yeah. pushing through knowing, you know, I gotta survive because I have the painted dogs to save or mm. we have to keep helping these people with all the minds that were left behind by whatever having that level of thought of I need to keep going to help these other people it's insane a yeah. lot of people in a survival situation <clears throat> especially watching like TV shows or whatnot about survival everyone you always get the feeling everyone's selfish when it comes to survival it's like me you know what I'm gonna stab him in the back um, so I can get an extra hot pocket <laughs> you know what I'm saying what would you do for a Klondike bar kind of thing yeah um, really 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 cool to have these kind of stories where something external kept mm. him going something knowing they could do more good yeah um yeah in a survival scenario i think that's really important um our whole philosophy with survival is community mm. you know you can't do it alone and so knowing that these people get through these thinking about you know i can do more to help the world um it's something important to remember in any survival scenario um, you can help other people, no matter who you are or what your skills are or whatnot. You're better off. The, the world's better off with you here. Yeah, is the point. Regardless. So, any other thoughts, guys? Uh, no. No. If you are planning on going to Zimbabwe or in Zimbabwe, <laughs> maybe you should look at donating or, or checking out the conservatorium if it's still around hopefully yeah. it is we'll have to look it up and if we can find it we will link it in the description below um they also never found out why his plane stalled oh yeah so i mentioned that yeah they don't they know never found out why that crash actually happened but yeah you know, things happen yeah so yeah if we can find that it'll be in the description below donate it's a good cause fantastic um, survival story there. Mm. Um, any other notes, Tyler? No, that was all I had. Fantastic. Highly recommend you watch the episode itself. It's got the actual guy talking about this story he mm. went through. Um, we can't really do it justice. Give our, th our thoughts on it, but you hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Or the survivor's mouth. Uh, this has been Post Ruina, talking about the show I Shouldn't Be Alive, Jaws of Death. We'll see you next time.